to welcome everyone today to Oak Brook Esther Stained Glass Studio and we are standing inside our display gallery where we have a lot of finished windows um, on display that we show customers and clients different options for stained glass. Everything in the gallery when you come in and see we've made here at the studio and we do new work as well as restoration so we have different examples of both of those types of work. Um, we, we've, we're very excited this year that we can say this is, we're celebrating our 40th year in business. So it's a great testament to all of the great crafts people that have worked at the studio throughout the years. And we're looking forward to sharing and showing you a little bit about some of the stages of, of the process. There's, there's quite a few different steps involved in making a stained glass window and um, I'm sure you'll find it interesting to see because it's a process that probably a lot of people haven't had the experience to see to see how a window is produced. So we welcome you again and we'll carry on with having you visit with some of the craftsmen. Hi there, I'm uh, Paul Jens and I work here at Oak Brook Esser doing sketches and designs and painting windows as well. So we've got over here a few of the designs that we've made in the past, and I brought them out earlier this week to use as inspiration for a project I'm working on right now. So you can see there are all levels of complexity from a pretty finished one without color to one with color, but Obviously, you don't need to do all of it sometimes because we can fill that in on our own. Um, these are some of the scaled drawings that I've already prepared and that I'm working on right now. So the scale right now is an inch equals a foot. So uh, basically, um, if this is about 11 inches across, in reality, this set of windows is going to be about uh, 11 feet across on the bottom. This one's gonna be a lot longer. So what is that? Maybe 18, 19 inches. And so that means this is gonna be 18 or 19 feet long, this set of windows. So I can show you some of the tools I use now. The, uh, the most important and the biggest tool is my table itself. It's got some adjustable qualities. Standing tables are all the rage, but I can use it sitting or standing either way. And it has a set right angle here, which of course comes in handy quite a bit. It's very adjustable. And I use that to make my right, right angled lines, horizontal, vertical. So if you wanna come closer here. These are just some designs I'm working on. They're not finalized, but there are some, some ideas. So of course, pencil's important. After I work in pencil, then I'll go in with some sort of marker and add lines, ink them, kind of finalize them. And then of course, if uh, the window calls for color, I have just a normal set of watercolors that works just fine. Lots of areas to mix different colors. The ones that are mixed down here end up in a lot of windows because they're ones I like. Um, so we might say, take a touch of this one. and add it to the window, just to get an idea of what the window will look like when it's actually made. See if our client likes the way it looks. Of course, we work a lot with the client to go back and forth. Uh, this one that we were working with wanted an old English bee, so I was trying to 
come up with a few different designs for one that might work. And the one I like the best, I finish the most and add a little color to, and we decide as a studio kind of what to present to our clients, and then they have the final word, of course. So I suppose that's most everything has to do with sketching. You uh, spend a little time on the details now, and the whole process becomes easier later on. Hello everybody and welcome to the back workroom at Oak Brook Esser Studios. This is where we have the majority of our glass inventory. You can see all that in the glass racks behind me and it appears very dark uh, and that is not the case. Uh, all the colors are, are very vibrant and very, very alive and one of the questions that we often get whenever people visit the gallery is where does the color come from? They don't understand if it's painted on or dyed somehow, but each color of glass actually has its own recipe. So just like whenever you're making cookies at home, whether it's chocolate chip cookies or peanut butter cookies, each one of those recipes is specific to that type of cookie. And the basic ingredients are the same, but whenever chocolate chips, of course, you're adding your, your bag of, of chocolate chips and the peanut butter, you take your scoops of peanut butter. And whenever you're working with glass, depending on the color of the glass, it's going to start with sand. And then the other ingredients that will be added will determine the color. And each, like I said, each, each color of glass has its own specific recipe and some of those recipes are very guarded just like those family secret recipes that you might have in your grandma's cookbook. So we've laid out here all the colors of the rainbow so you can see um, again there's all different shades and densities of color these are mouth blown antiques that have come from Europe and will come back to this cylinder again. So whenever the recipe is made, that glass is super hot. It's a couple thousand degrees and they take a gather of glass, which is just a big gob of glass. And it's on the end of a long blow pipe, which you can see up here. That's, this is where it would be attached and they make a big glass bubble that creates this cylinder. This is cooled, and then once it's cooled, it's cut and reheated so that this will open up and flatten out to create sheets of glass. And from there, then, we get all the colors that are used to fill the patterns and create the, the windows and this to me is very magical it's what brings those windows to life and it doesn't always have to be just solid colors um, we have some keep them down here this is drapery glass that whenever that sheet is molten it's kind of like pie dough and they take wooden sticks and they smoosh it together and it makes the folds in it, which creates really beautiful flowers or leaves or clouds or anything that your imagination can take you to for the use of that glass. And then there's some super cool streaky glasses that whenever different colors can be added together. This one was made in England. These come from Germany. So, but um, again, it, it gives you that motion and that, that feeling of wispiness, which is, again, part of the magic of glass. And so, um, come and visit us and uh, see how all of this comes together to form a window. Thanks so much.
The, the next stage we'd like to share with you is the glass cutting and we'll review that with you. There's a few um, different phases of this stage and um, we will we'll go over those starting with the sketch. You, Paul had showed you early on that we do sketches for customers that are done in scale and this helps give the customer an idea of what the finished window would look like and, and by doing it in scale it's very representational of the final work and you can also see in the sketch you, you they're in color and, and the sketch is used by the glass cutter to help select the glass <clears throat> so we go from the small sketch um, that we have here and then to enable us to cut the glass, we need to enlarge the sketch to a full size, we call it. And in this tray here, you can see a, a full size layout of, of one of these panels here. And we've actually cut the patterns. We need to cut the glass or the paper into patterns. And then those patterns are used to cut the glass from. So we have a one of the pattern pieces here it's a little heavier paper and we can either choose to cut around the pattern piece um, with the glass cutter or we can trace the pattern piece onto the glass and cut cut it out that way so you can see a number of different colors we have thousands of different options of glass to select from and the glass cutting is a it's it takes a lot of skill and understanding of color to to do a nice job so we take, um, again, the pattern piece one at a time. We're, we're doing this on a piece of clear just so you can maybe see the lines and cutting better. But we would, we would pick red, green, or any color that we would think it would be appropriate um, for the piece. And we just use a fine marker and we can trace around, trace around that pattern. And then we'll use that line to cut the glass out. And we use, a, um, <clears throat> we use a carbide glass cutter. It's a very basic tool. It's got a carbide wheel, um, and, and this will score the glass, and the glass will break along the line of least resistance, basically, along that score that you make. So I'll put on my glasses, and I'll just show you how that would work. You can maybe hear that slight little score, and that's knowing that you're scoring the glass, and you can break that off. And then we'll go and basically follow the lines along. You kind of look kind of over the top of the cutter. Everybody has a little different cutting technique, but this um, tool is called a Nipex, and you can see it has like a curved jaw, and this helps um, provide pressure that you can break right along your, your score line. When you have a very little amount of glass to break off the piece. Um, it's harder to do just with your hands. So the Nipex kind of gives you a little more leverage to be able to, to break that glass off. So again, we'll do that for every piece. And, and then put the pattern piece, we'll check. You can check the pattern um, in the glass to make sure that's cut properly and then we'll just set it back in the tray and then we do that over and over with different tones and and colors we sometimes will we may change a few colors as we're as we're going and we work on light tables this is a light table here that if we can we can illuminate Laura can show you you can illuminate a window this one here you can see fully cut out and we may say that there's a tint in there that maybe doesn't harmonize exactly how we want so that would give us the option of seeing the window cut out before it would go to the next stage which is glazing which Otto's going to show you so that's about the basics of the, the glass cutting process so hope you enjoy. I'm Otto Olsen and I work here at Oak Brookessa. I'm going to walk you through uh, some, of the, some of the steps to actually physically glaze a window.
So Paul will show you the kinds of ins and outs of how to cut the grass. Once it's cut downstairs usually, it comes upstairs. This is a restoration, so this has already been pre-cut. Um, so here's what it looks like when it arrives on a tray to be glazed. Everything is all individual pieces of grass. So it's basically like a big jigsaw. Um, but obviously we want the jigsaw to be permanent, so we have to construct it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab a couple of these pieces. Sometimes in restorations I'll glaze them on what we call a rubbing. So just like in high school where you would go and you would rub patterns with a crayon on a piece of paper. This is basically what we do here before we take it all apart. We mark what leads they are and then what that does is that allows me to give me a fighting chance uh, because it's an old window and you never know if it's been cut well or glazed well or, 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 or none of the above. So basically what this allows me to do is this allows me to just pop these pieces on top of these lines and that will help, especially when it's something so complicated like this with lots of twists and turns and whatnot. I can actually look down and I can see, okay, well that definitely goes there or that might need a little bit of a trim and whatnot. So that looks like it fits. Then what I'll do is we will stretch the lead. It comes in cases. I'll pop it in the vise here like this. This has already been stretched, but basically we pop it in, give it a pull. That gives it some rigidity and it's nice and straight. So from there, I will walk over to here. Here's some odds and ends that I can still use. What I'll do then is I'll pick up my Don Carlos now. It's very sharp. This could be used to cut the lead. I tend to use it just to mark it, um, but I'll show you what I do. So now what I have to do is I have to keep this together. The lead is eight shaped, so the glass sits in this side and that side. So now I have to fill in those lines. So I'll just pop this out again and I'll follow the curve of the glass and it will allow me to just bend, bend the lead slightly. And then what I'll do is where this line runs down here, that's where I want to make the cut. So I will just use my Don Carlos just to score it. And I don't know if you can see that that gives me a little line there. So that's my cut line because that's this angle. So if the angle's not too steep, I will use my side cutters. Basically, I will line that up like that and then just snip it down. So that now should be the same angle as this. There we go. Obviously that's too long, so I need to cut this side. So then I'll pop this back in here on the other side of the H shaped lead just my little tapper. Now to get this in here, I'm going to have to cut this. So again, pick up my Don Carlos, give it a little bit of a mark, pop that out, there's that mark again. So now, I put my jigsaw back together, and now I have a space to pop this one in. So because this is round, we want both sides to meet at the same point. So what I'll do is I'll put a little mark up here and that will allow me to bend this all the way around here. Same kind of principle as that. I can bend this around here mark along that line there so I know that I can line that up on here again let's do that again hey it's the pressure <laughs> Too much pressure. So there's my line, little mark there. But that just gives gives you an example of how 
how fragile this can be. So now I need this to overlap. So then again, I'll pop that up, pull that along, and there's my little line again. Circles can be pretty tricky, actually. There's a lot of bending and lifting and in and out. There's my little line. Now, hopefully, these two lines will meet up. It's a little bit too long. So again, I've got to take it out. Use my side cut to give it a little trim. Line that line up with that. And there we go. Can't get it back in there. So again, when you're making stained glass windows, it's a lot of out and in and out and in and jiggle and jiggle. There we go, so there we have that. So basically what we do now is, I wanna give you an example of another way that I use to cut the lead. So this one here, for example, I need to be cut a little bit longer, a little bend, but here, it's a pretty steep angle. So again, I'm gonna mark that. And I can't cut that. I can't get that angle on there with that because it will just crush it. So if you want to walk over here, this is pretty much like a jeweler's saw. And this will allow me to push this through and maintain that steep cut there. So clean. And that's something that I wouldn't be able to get using the the side pincers. Look at that. Perfect. And then that will end up going down there. But that's how we do it. And then we just keep building it up. Um, we use horseshoe nails, for example. You know, if I'm gonna start working around in that, I'll pick an old piece of lead. I'll tuck it in there. Use the old horseshoe nail. Now that's solid. Otherwise, and I've been there, I'll do something really complicated like this. I'll go to push this in, and if that's not all, you know, tapped in like that, I'll push this in, and then this will all go flying in the air, and then I've pretty much got to start all over again. So learn that lesson. So then just build it up nice and solid, big jigsaw, bendy lead, beautiful window. Okay, so what we have here is we have some part of the panel that has been soldered and part of the panel that hasn't been soldered. A couple of things we need to do this. We need a brush, some oleic acid or peanut, peanut oil. We need a soldering iron and a temperature control. This just basically allows me to uh, control the temperature of the iron. So what we'll do is on the joints that haven't been soldered here, we'll add a little bit of the oleic acid here. That basically allows the solder to take to the lead. Now, a couple of things that you've got to be aware of. You do not want the iron to be too hot or else you'll just melt, melt the lead. So I'll just see if my iron is hot enough. Yep, just so this solder flows off the off the iron. So then basically what we do is we touch the joint with the lead and then just rest the soldering iron on top of that just for a second. Give it a little bit of a wiggle. Make sure it's filled up. And there we go. And then on here again, just touch it. You might need to just add a little bit more, a little bit more solder just until the the crease is filled up. Remember, not too long, or else you'll melt the lead. It's easier to add, as you can't take any away. Yep, and then once the iron has reached its optimum temperature, everything that was listed before flows a lot easier too. 
But this takes a lot of practice. And trust me, I've, uh, I've burnt a few lead lines in my time. And then once this area is done, basically, we get a rag, give it a wipe down. And then when the whole panel is soldered, everything then becomes a solid unit. Then we can flip it over. And then obviously we need to do the other side as well. Okay, this stage that we're looking at right now is one of the final stages of the window production. It's called the cementing. Um, and this, this stage happens right after the glazing part that Otto showed you. And what this step does um, is it, it waterproofs the window by pushing, um, we have a glazing compound that we have special made for us. Um, it's very pliable and it gets pushed in between the glass and the keam all the way around and squeezes in to infill any space that's left over between the two materials. And it, and it actually adds a lot of overall rigidity. It's, it's one of the steps that really unifies the whole, the whole window. And it also, stained glass windows do not technically have to have storm and this would be how it would keep the weather out. The, wet, the uh, putty is a weatherproofing element. So the, a couple of the parts involved in that the main one is, like, is the putty, as I said. And then we take <clears throat> just a stiff brush and we push the putty in between, kind of with a circular motion, we push it in between gently against the glass and forcing it between the glass and the cane, and that, that infills it and makes it very sturdy. So we do that over the whole window, one side at a time. And after one side is done, we let this set for 10 days before we flip it and do the other side. So we start with the putty. We have a simple brush. This one's cut down, but it's a typical scrub brush, works very well. And then once everything is puttied, we take a very technical tool called a FID. That's basically a sharpened wood dowel. But what it does is it, um, we're able to remove the excess putty with this FID. And the, the noise you're hearing is uh, the glass, this particular glass is rippled. It has a texture. so. You can hear the, the wood fid slide along the surface of the glass, and you can see the you can see that the putty builds up on the wood fid, and that's helping to take off the excess putty because it's uh, one of the messier stages of what we do, and it's it's kind of a little bit of work to clean to clean off all the putty that we've just put on. So we go I'll go around a few sections here so I can show you the next step so and the putty has to be the putty has to be mixed at just the right consistency otherwise if it's too stiff you can't carefully push it between the glass and the cane and if it's too loose it's really hard to get off in this process so that's a important stage so we've removed the excess putty then we take a paint thinner on a rag and the next level of removing the putty you can kind of see the cane starts to shine up as you're getting the putty off all the surfaces and it starts to burnishing is a kind of a finish that's imparted on the cane during this process and it, it cleans it up and gives it a nice kind of pewter tone so this, we would do this over the whole window. And then the next step, we use a, it's not sawdust, it's actually a wood flower that's used in the smoking industry. And it's kind of a dustless sawdust, so to speak. And we sprinkle that over the top and again with the rag. And every step we take it, you can just kind of see the glass starts to shine more, the cane has a real nice patina on it 
and it's actually one of my favorite steps because it it just immediately makes the window um, look very shiny and different. And then the last, one of the last steps again, a, a dry brush, straw brush, we, we then kind of start burnishing and polishing. This is also removing putty that is in little cracks and in that texture of that glass. So we do that over the whole window, <coughs> excuse me. And then we take another, another pointed stick or the fid, and once more, we'll go around the glass edge. Again, you can hear that texture. It's hard to get the putty out of that texture. But we'll do this once more over the whole section. And then the very final stage in this process is then we'll take a vacuum and vacuum that up. So that's a, a quick quick tour of this stage and that pretty much sums up this part.